Hello golf fans, Chris Durrell here with RotorPros.com to bring you another DFS PGA preview video. Before we do that, if you're not a RotorPros member, let me tell you a little bit about ourselves. Go over to RotorPros.com. This is where you're going to find our free content. We've got an entry video here. We're going to tell you a little bit about the Slack community that we have. Uh, we've got our free articles posted here. You can find all the sports articles under the article section as well as general strategy. We cover uh, multiple sports general strategy for that as well as some videos that are coming out as well. You can connect to our Facebook page through videos and you can grab your, if you want to get in on the premium content, click on the sign up button in the top right hand corner. Choose a weekly, monthly or yearly subscription. You're going to get a free trial with that and if you use promo code RP50 you will get 50% off your first purchase after the trial is up. We cover PGA, NBA, NHL, UFC, soccer, NFL, MLB coming up uh, March, April, and then NASCAR is back in about two, three weeks here. We cover many more sports as well. Gives you access into our Slack chat each and every week for PGA. Come in here and I post course information, trends, stats, course history, form. I do that for you know all sports, different stats and stuff like that. We got one-on-one -on -one coaching. We've got tons of different channels in here to help you grow as a DFS player and get better. With that, let's jump into this week's video. Jumping right into it here, we've got the Farmers Insurance Open this week from La Jolla, California. That is Torrey Pines Golf Course. Once again, we're going to have a two-course rotation. We're going to concentrate mostly on the south course. Um, so what happens is players in the field will play one round on each of the south and north course on Thursday and Friday. And then the cut will be made, top 65 and ties on Friday, and the those who make the cut will play the south course only. So three of the four rounds will be on the south course. That's kind of what I'm looking at this week. As you can see, we've got a beautiful course, seaside. We're going to talk about the weather here soon, but if you look at a few of these pictures, this is from PGATour.com. You look at some of these whole pictures, you can see easily why wind will definitely affect the scores, um, our strategies, uh, it is wide open out there. The north course is a little bit more covered, um, but we're again, we're going to talk about weather here shortly. We're going to jump into the sheet. We'll look at the courses here. So we've got Torrey Pines South, Torrey Pines North. The first noticeable difference here is that the south course is a whopping 7,765 yards on the scorecard. Um, I got it wrong here. It's actually par 72. The north course is also a par 72, but it is about 500 yards less. So looking at the south course specifically, we've got only one hole, one par four under 400 yards. We've got two in that mid range, and we've got seven monsters of 450 plus yards. Three of them are 480 or 100, 480 yards or longer. We've still got five holes of 450 plus on the north course here as well. So long irons are definitely going to be key here. Some other information you can find on the sheet. This is the course. We can find course stats for the last two years. Now this is hole by hole. You can see which holes played the easiest, which ones didn't. You can see the percentage of birdies that come from par fours, fives, threes. How many eagles were made, where they were made, um, where the holes ranked, and that sort of information. You can then look at the player stats for the last five years. Um, if you come down to the bottom, I've got averages for each season. These are the players that made the cut. And then we've got uh, overall last five years driving accuracy and greens and regulation. So the first thing you can tell here, not only is the south course long, um, but it's tough to hit the fairways. You're only going to see about 50 to 55% of players hitting those fairways. Um, so laying up and trying to hit the fairways is not going to be an option this week with the length. So we are looking at bombers. Um, I'm going to get into my key stats here in a minute and the players that I'm looking at. Just want to continue. You can look at detailed course history here. Um, the approach shot data. This is from Fantasy National Golf Club. This is just looking at the south course and where the percentage of uh, approaches will come from. So as you can see, long irons are going to be key. So looking at the model. So this is the cheat sheet. We're just going to slide right over to the model here. First of all, if you want to see a full tutorial, definitely check out the YouTube channel. I've got a full tutorial up there. Uh, so this week I'm looking at 10% off the tee, um, add in 15% to driving distance. I really want to capture those guys uh, and boost them up the rankings that are going to have that distance. We need to keep in mind that driving distance on the PGA Tour um, is calculated a little odd, so it they pick two holes every tournament and take that player's average drive from those two 
holes, whether they be par fours and fives, wherever they're using their driver, um, they're taking those average. So it really isn't a full driving distance. It gives you an idea. If you want to go a little bit deeper, um, I use Fantasy National, and I'm looking heavily at driving distance gained. So it's, it's kind of giving you an idea of is that driving distance that that player is using, is it gaining an advantage over the field? Um, so that's one thing I will look at in Fantasy National as compared to just straight up driving distance from the PGA Tour site. So then we got approach, uh, 20% here on strokes gained approach. Um, I put some weight, you can put more weight on this obviously on long iron proximity. Um, and then I've got five on around the green. The reason I like around the green, we've got smaller greens this week. Uh, about 4,500 to 5,000 on average square feet on the south course. So not only are we shooting, you know, our players going to be having a lot of approach shots come from long distances, but the greens are smaller. So there's, that's why the greens in regulation percentage is a little bit below average compared to uh, regular tours, to the all the regular tour in relation to all the tour events out there. Um, so players are going to be missing greens. What happens when players are missing greens? They don't want to give up a bunch of strokes to the field. You got to be good scrambling. Um, so if you got a bomber who's good at scrambling, that's a really good combination because he doesn't need to hit 80% at greens to take advantage of his distance if he's not giving up bogeys doubles if he's really good around the green. So that those are two things I'll kind of look at together. Um, like for instance, Rory McIlroy, really good driving distance, not so good around the green. Then you got John Rahm, top 20 in both or 23rd and strokes in around the green so that's kind of one thing i'll look at if i'm looking at a bomber down here in the bottom i want to look at his around the green here's one that stands out Wyndham clark seventh in driving distance 17th in around the green so that's one way i will look at those two stats together this week so if a player maybe isn't great in approach i i want to make sure he's going to have distance and if he isn't great at approach i want him to be great around the green if he's not great around the green i want him to be great on approach shots that's kind of what I'm looking at and then I'll start narrowing it down into those proximity ranges like I talked about and then par 4 scoring gonna be very important um, the par 5s are gonna be the easiest of the holes with about 43 45 percent of all the birdies coming on those holes I think where players and in court looking at correlations from from years past the par 4 scoring is where players can really separate themselves whether that be um, just getting a ton more birdies than everyone else on the par fours or just not giving up as many strokes on those par fours, giving bogeys back to the field and, and things like that. And then, of course, very correlation, very high correlation to DraftKings scoring, FanDuel scoring, any kind of fantasy scoring is birdie or better percentage. So that is going to be key in my model this week as well. And then the model on the far right, that's just the stats model. The, the overall model is going to be 45% on stats, 20% on uh, course history, 15% on odds to win, and then I've got 20% on DraftKings form last five events for each player. So if you're fairly unfamiliar with the sheet, there is a lot of data on here. We've got salary to odds differential. That's pretty self-explanatory looking at DraftKings and FanDuel pricing versus odds. Um, we've got course history, last 10 years. We've got averages for the last 5 and 10. We've got current form, each player's last 10 events. So it isn't the last 10 events on tour. It's each player's last 10 events, 5 events. And then we've got averages, average finish for last 5 and 10, and average DK for last 5 and 10. The green section is raw stats. Um, right now, I believe we're at 60% new season, 40% of last season kind of mixed in there. I will be changing that up uh, as we kind of get... Closer to the Masters, probably into February, mid-February, I'm going to start going to probably more of an 80-20 model and then uh, kind of getting into the Masters and then kind of into June into the U.S. Open. Somewhere in that range is where I usually get up into the 90 to 100% just current season stats. But you can also, uh, you can adjust them. If you want to adjust the model for any of these stats, which the orange section is just rankings of the raw stats in the green section that's how we can model it and give us these overall rankings these overall rankings are the model rankings they're not my own personal rankings my rankings will be up usually wednesday morning to wednesday afternoon me and dane uh, both have our rankings posted on the sheet uh, top three to five at each price range kind of gives you an idea you can build a lot of lineups out of just those players as well i also highlight players and i'm going to talk about a few that stand out to me here early in the week before we do that i want to take a look at the weather I told you it's going to be very important um, i use Windfinder, and i'm right now at the blacks beach uh, torrey pines which is right on the south course where this uh, weather station is so as you can see 
Uh, Thursday starts out fine. Wind gets up to 14 to 20 mile an hour, 14 to 17 mile an hour. Uh, with some gusts a little bit higher than that in the afternoon on Thursday, round one. Round two, that wind keeps up as players go out in the morning and continues on pretty much throughout the day. We've got some rain in there as well kind of throughout the day. The rain looks kind of heavier throughout the night, um, but there will be rain early on uh, Friday morning as well. This is going to be big for showdown. We're going to talk about that as showdown gets closer, but for the full tourney, um, the wave that I'm looking at right now is going to be a Thursday morning, Friday afternoon. They're going to get a bad run in the Friday afternoon here with some winds. You know, guys getting out at, at noon, 1 p.m. are going to get those really high winds at 21 mile an hour when they start. But the rain's going to be gone down a little bit for them. Um, definitely not as bad as it is in the morning. And then they also get Thursday morning where there's going to be not much wind at all versus the Friday, or sorry, Thursday p.m., Friday a.m. wave, they've got wind the whole time, plus this heavier rain, uh, the heaviest of the rains on Friday morning. So I'm not going to be making specific lineups with all six players on one wave, but when it comes down to um, player A versus player B, who am I going to roster in the same price range? I'm definitely going to be looking at tee times um, and looking for that. The earlier on Thursday, the better. Gets you out there later on Friday, the better, to avoid the rain and the winds. So that's kind of how I'm looking at weather right now. That might change. Stay tuned to uh, all the chats. I will be updating in chat as uh, Wednesday night comes around because we've got a 5 a.m. Eastern lock on Thursday. So I'll probably be up until about 10, 11 p.m. Eastern on Wednesday, just kind of monitoring that weather, and I will give you my final thoughts in chat something else i'll also be doing here as tea times come out today tomorrow is i will be adding tea times to the sheet once again it'll be just left um, of the country here you're going to see tea times i'll just add that there right now and that's going to give you a tea time wave um, so it'll be thursday a.m or thursday p.m and then you're also going to see the tea time so if you're looking to really target those guys on Thursday early, um, you're going to be able to see right on the sheet where that is. Before looking at tee times or anything like that, here are a few players I'm going to go over um, that kind of stand out in my model. John Rahm's going to be GPP only. He's number one in the model right now, but he's GPP only. He withdrew last week, apparently hurt himself in the gym the Friday before, um, claiming he's not completely 100%, but also said he's not going to play. He said he could have played last week, Probably could have made the cut, uh, probably even sniffed out a top 20, but if he can't win, he doesn't want to play. That also says a lot if he's coming back to play this week is that he thinks he has a chance to win. So with all that information, he's still going to be GPP only as the most expensive player. Um, I don't mind Rory either. He hasn't played since the Masters, but he has a really great track record here as well. I like Tony Fino, top 10 Tony here. Um, had a chance to win last week. Came up short once again, um, but I'll take a top five, top ten from Tony, you know, and with how much he checks the boxes this week, he's got course history, as you can see. He's got form, as you can see. He's got the distance. I'll go look at some of the ranks here when it comes to stats. He's ninth in ball striking. He's decent around the green. Um, he's got the driving distance, like I said. Um, long iron proximity is there. He is top 20, top 17 in both par four and five scoring. Birdie or better percentage, he is eighth. So definitely like Tony Fino. If you're building a cash lineup, I'm going to be avoiding those top two guys. I think we can start with Tony. If you want to go more balance, that's all. That's definitely an option as well. But I like starting my lineups with Tony Fino just with his consistency. <clears throat> Moving on down the list, uh, Hideki Matsuyama is definitely going to be a core play for me at his price at 9200 on DraftKings. He's got a pretty good track record here last year, T43, but T3 the year before, T12. He's making cuts. He's got top 15 upside. He's got winning upside. Um, what I really like is that his ball striking, he gained 6.8 strokes on approach last week, but unfortunately he's lost 9.7 and 3.8 strokes putting the last two weeks, so that's really kept him from popping into that top 10 on the leaderboard on Sunday. I like the, that the price is staying down. He's at a track that where he's had success. He's got the distance. He fits the stats model, except for the putting. If he can get his putting together where he can even gain, like at the Houston Open in November, um, he he gained five strokes ball striking, but he also gained four and a half strokes putting. That's a little bit higher than we're going to see out of him, but it just goes to show you that he's got that winning upside when he gains like uh, two plus strokes uh, on the field in terms of putting. And he can do that. He's done that multiple times, um, but he can also lose five to ten strokes putting as well. So it seems like it's 
it seems like it maybe shouldn't be a core play. It should be more of a GPP play. Uh, I like it as a core play just because the price, like I said, is still in that low 9K range. I think he gives us that top 20 floor um, with, how, with his course history and form. And I think he's got that upside if he gets that putter going is why he's a core play for me. Mark Leishman pops as well. Um, he's obviously won this last year. He's coming in with some good form here again. Uh, in 2021, he's played two tournaments. A tournament he played in Hawaii. Uh, so T24 wasn't great at the Tournament of Champions. He lost five strokes putting while gaining four strokes on approach. Um, so there was some positive signs there to start the year after he missed the cut back at the OHL in December. But he came to the Sony, um, gained 7.4 strokes T to green, 6.1 of those coming from the approach shot. He turned that putter around as well and gained 2.6 strokes putting. That's a difference of about six and a half strokes. So I definitely like that big jump there coming back to where obviously where he won last year. He's had really good course history over the last 10 years. He's only missed one cut um, with a bunch of top 10s in there and, of course, that win last year. Ryan Palmer, uh, same story, excellent form, um, excellent course history. He's going to be super chalky this week. I think for pivoting off those two chalky guys, I like Bubba Watson. Um, hasn't played here a bunch, but he's won here in the past, a long time ago, 10 years ago, not very relevant in terms of predicting the future. But after taking five years off at this course, he came back and finished T6 last year. He has been some pretty darn good form, showing a ton of upside and a ton of consistency lately as well. So I think we can pivot to Bubba Watson, who's probably going to be a little bit lower owned due to the Palmer and Leishman factors this week. Going down into the 7K range, a couple players I like here. Uh, Cameron Davis, first of all, he's coming off an excellent T3. Um, he gained 5.5 strokes on approach, 5.4 strokes putting. I don't see that continuing with the putter, but he's usually around a you know field average type putter. He's gained strokes uh, six, six of his last eight events, or six of his last nine events. He's gained strokes um, over one stroke, not just like 0 .4, 0 .3. So that's pretty good that his putter has been pretty consistent lately. The ball striking has been consistent. So I'm definitely even at at the Houston Open where. He made the cut. He lost five strokes by and He lost five strokes around the green. And he lost four strokes on approach. He still made the cut and, and finished T60. I know that's like dead last of the guys that made the cut. But he still made the cut um, on his like all-time worst event. <laughs> um, scrolling back and looking at his stats. It is going back to the start. Even 2016, he hasn't lost that many strokes T to green uh, ever. And the fact that he still made the cut doing that. Gives me a good sign that I, I'm going to be rolling with Cameron Davis in this zone. Because the chalk this week, uh, I don't know if you've heard, but Gary Whitland's going to be chalky this week. He's got course history. He's got form. He's got the distance. The U.S. Open is here at this course in the summer. He's excellent at the U.S. Opens. Um, so Gary Woodland is going to be chalky. I'm going to be underweight, personally, because just I don't... Looking at Corey Connors, that's the next player I'm going to mention here. Connors and Davis, both 9th and 10th in my rankings, uh, 58th for Gary Woodland. Connors has better form. Um, that just really stands out. Like, looking at the numbers here, Connors is, we know that he's just a ball-striking king. Like, going back to March last year, or sorry, going back to the start, um, the return of golf at the Charles Schwab in June, um, he's gained strokes both off the tee and approach. 14, 15 out of 17 events. Um, absolutely amazing. He's a ball striking king. The putter has been, like back in 2020, there were events, uh, it was kind of like Matsuyama, where at times he would lose four, five, six, seven strokes putting. It would just be terrible. He's still making cuts with that ball striking, but he just wasn't nearly as consistent because the putter was just terrible. It isn't as terrible now. Um, going back to the start of this season at the Sanderson Farms for him, he's gained 0.1, lost 0.7, gained 2.6, lost 0.2, gained 0.2. So he's right around average with the putter, and it is shown. Um, he's finished T17, T61, T8, T24, T10, T10, T17. Absolute freak consistency for a 7K price tag, uh, even 9500 on FanDuel. He's going to be a core player, one of my highest owned players this week, and I think he's going to be a little bit lower owned, not low owned, but lower owned just because of the woodland factor. I think the same with Davis and Connors. They're going to be, they should be chalky, but with Gary Woodland down here in the same price and everyone talking about him, I think we're going to see, you know, we're going to maybe get them at a 3 to 5% discount than we would normally if Gary Woodland, say, wasn't in this event. 
Moving down, a couple players in the low 7K range. Max Homa stands out. Uh, looking at the stats model, everything isn't great. Um, he missed the cut three times, 2014, 15, and 17. Boom, bounce back. A uh, com- little bit of a different player now. Better ball striker. Uh, Twenty Last year he finished T9. And he comes in with good form. Um, he's coming off two events where he finished T12 and T21 at the OHL in December and then the Amex uh, last week. What stands out with those first of all, is the fact that he had one absolutely terrible round in each of those events, or he could have been in top 10 in both of those. So the ball striking's been pretty good. The putting's been good. Um, He's got some course history fresh in his mind from last year. Only 7,400. I'm definitely on Max Homa. Um, And then John Ha down here in this range. He's 17th in my model. Whenever I find a player in that sub-7,500 range on DraftKings that's high in my model, I start digging in. Well, um, he doesn't He's got excellent course history. He's played here in each of the last nine years. He's only missed one cut, two top 10s, three top 25s, and I'll even take a T45 at 7K in cash games. Um, Looking at his consistency lately, he's gained strokes on approach in five straight events. Even with losing almost five strokes putting last week, he still finished T21 at the American Express. So he's got form. He's got course history. Um, If we slide over... Just look at his like driving distance numbers and stuff like that when we start breaking down the stats. That is one troublesome area for him. Um, even the long irons aren't great. So he might end up being by the time we get to lock, turn it into more of a GPP play. I don't usually come down to this range for cash anyway. But the consistency, I think he can even scrape out uh, a cut made on this long course, which doesn't exactly suit him. But the ball striking has just been there. Um, where I think, you know, we, we want to start looking at around the green. I mentioned that earlier. If he doesn't have driving distance, look at this. He's got, he's fourth in strokes gained approach, backs that up 16th around the green. So he may not hit a ton of greens. He's got the upside too, but if he doesn't, he's got that scrambling to back it up. So definitely liking John Ha here. So those are a few players that stand out. If you've got any questions, definitely hit me up in chat. Um, Any questions about the sheet, the weather, stay tuned. There's a lot more to come. Uh, Dane um, has an article over at Rotopros that's going to be out later today, so make sure to go check that out. He's got a ton of information in there. And then my initial picks, all of them will be up today with the rankings up tomorrow. Thanks for checking out the video. Make sure to like, subscribe, hit that bell. You're going to get a notification when all my videos come out. Um, Let's go get some green screens this week. Good luck, everyone.